Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to what I am looking forward to as a very fun and exciting and valuable business changers lesson tonight with a very special guest, the one and only Bond Halbert. Now, I need to tell you a little something about why I'm so excited about this, about something that happened to me several years ago. I wrote about it in my email the other day, so hopefully you saw that, and that's probably why you're here. And I told you about this guy, and let me, let me preface this by saying this was probably 2012, I want to say, and it was after the launch of my back-end blueprint, and, and I was doing a speaking gig in, in Vegas. And I got to tell you, I was kind of new to this world, new to the marketing world. You know, I mean, I had just come out of the corporate world. Those of you who know my, my background know that I was, I was a corporate sales and marketing executive for years and years and, and um, was launching my own career, launched my product. And I, and I didn't have the direct marketing knowledge that I have today. And so, frankly, I didn't know about some of the legends of direct marketing. So, you know, I was kind of new to this. And so I didn't know then what I now know about who Bond Halbert is and his lineage and why his background is so special. But what I will tell you is, so without knowing anything about Bond's fa famous dad, Gary, okay, Bond made this huge impression on me. And he did this because I'm sitting there in the audience in Las Vegas waiting for my turn to take the stage. And I'm chatting with some people, and i got to tell you, you know, um, I'm feeling pretty good. They're, I'm surrounded by people that know who I am. They're here to listen to me speak. They know my products. And, you know, feeling pretty good. And I'm watching, and this guy takes the stage with these huge, huge, oversized clown shoes. I, I said, like, size 22 bozo clown shoes. And he got my attention right away, right away. I'm looking like, okay, what's this guy doing with clown shoes? And then Bond goes on to tell us that he's going to give us a very valuable lesson. He's going to teach us how we've been doing things wrong our whole life and how if we're taught something the wrong way our whole life and we do it wrong, sometimes by just making one simple change can drastically affect the outcome, drastically affect your results. And he demonstrates this on the clown shoes. So he takes out the clown shoes and he and he puts them up on, on a table where we can all see them. And he says, let me show you, this is the way you've been taught to tie your shoes. And he goes through and he shows us, yeah, <laughs> the exact way I've been taught to tie my shoes. He says, and 95% of the world has been taught to tie their shoes this way. And they make they make the, the cross and then they make the bow and they take this and they loop it over the top and they come around and they make the second bow and they pull it down. He says, the problem is, he says, that's not the right way to tie shoes because look how easy it is to untie and you just quick little tug and the whole shoe comes untied. He says, that's why you're constantly stepping on your shoelaces. That's why you're constantly having to bend down and retie your shoes. And that's why it's the wrong way. He says, but not, let me show you just one simple little change you could make and the drastic improvement it's going to make. He says, this time when you make the cross and you make the loop, instead of wrapping around the top to make the second loop, I'm going to go the other way and wrap it underneath around the bottom and then pull it through and make the second loop. And then he does that. He says, now look. And he takes a shoe by the shoelace and he starts whipping it around over his head like a lasso and the darn thing doesn't come untied. Okay? So he got my attention. And he says, this is true in everything in life. He says, if you're taught the wrong way to do something, there's a good chance that you could make just one small improvement and get tremendous, tremendous results. He says, and I'm going to teach you that right now. And like I said, this is, this is four years ago. Now, you ask me about any other presentation in the room, including my own. You ask me what I talked about in that room that day. I don't remember. But I remember every word that Bond said. Bond, is that fair? Did I remember pretty well? Yeah, you remembered it very well. <laughs> I don't even remember what I said that day, okay? Um, <laughs> so, so that just goes to show you the impression it made. So here's why this is going to be, I know, I don't even know what Bond's going to talk about today, but I know this. I know that it's going to be memorable for you. 
I know that you're going to get a lot of value out of this, and I know it's going to be entertaining. And I'll promise you this. I've been talking to Bond for the past few days as we've been getting for, ready for this. And, you know, I found myself a lot of times as Bond's listening or as Bond's, talk, Bond's talking, I'm sitting back in my chair and I'm actually closing my eyes and seeing what Bond's saying. I have never heard a more visual speaker in my life. And you're about to find out what I mean right now. So, Bond, welcome to my world. We've got a great audience. These, these, are, these are folks that have been looking forward to hearing you speak all week long, and I can't tell you how happy I am that you're here. I appreciate the invite. Um, can you guys see my screen? I'm just wondering if, I, if you guys would see the Skype screen as well. No, we're not seeing – I don't think we're seeing the Skype screen. I'm seeing it says copy editing. Okay, good. Okay, we're only seeing well, – why, you got two monitors over there? No, no, no. There's just a in front of in front of my uh, slideshow. I'm actually seeing like the the questions and stuff like that. Oh, they may pop up once in a while. I I, I tend to turn Skype off, but we are seeing it says copy no, no, editing. No, no. The go to webinar part. Oh, actually, and it's it's funny. It's, it closes automatically too. Okay, so you'll have to field questions for me. Well, I will watch you. questions for you absolutely, and I'm going to mute. It's all yours. Okay. Well, I feel like I have a lot of sh a lot to live up to here. Uh, the presentation I have is actually kind of short, so we can take a lot of questions. Um, at the end, I can teach you know you a lot of stuff about copywriting. I know that <clears throat> because I actually am able to teach new tricks to people who have been veteran copywriters for decades, um, and that's what I'm going to teach you one um, a couple of techniques tonight. And um, but I can take questions, and I don't mind if they're, they're about my father. Uh, people sometimes think that I'm not, you know, I want to make it all about me, and I love talking about my dad or about me um, or any of the things I've done and stuff I published or put out. So it's going to be very. Um, I'm going to cover some information, and then I'm going to open up the floor and answer everybody's questions. Okay, um, this first slide is basically just to tell you exactly what I'm going to cover tonight. I'm going to talk to you, and actually I'll even cover a little bit more. I'm going to talk to you about the three phases, it should be phases, <laughs> sorry, of good copywriting. And with that, I'm also going to give you a basic editing step, an intermediate editing technique, and an advanced editing technique. And the reason I want to do this is this is, a, you know what, I'm going to get the, the pitch out of the way just to explain why I'm doing this and what this is all about is I put together an, a book about copywriting editing. And the copywriting um, editing book that I put together really is more like a, uh, it's, it's part of an overall formula that I have for writing copy and, t uh, and, and showing people how to write copy and where it is. And so I'll talk a little bit about the book as we go and what's in it and what's good about it. But I'm actually going to do this to show you and prove to you that there are things in there in the copywriting world that even if you've heard one or two of these, there's very few people who have ever heard all three. And if you have, it's because you've listened to me. Okay, um, so first thing we're going to cover is, of course, the three phases of good copywriting. So, and that somehow got repeated. Okay. Phase one is research, and you will hear other people talking about this um, a lot, and research is where all the power in your marketing comes from. Knowing your customers, knowing what to tell them, uh, what to sell them, what to say, when to say it, um, how to say it, and you know all of that information really trumps everything else in the copywriting process. Uh, my favorite example of this, which I use and I use in the book, is that is the Domino's Pizza ad campaign. You know, it was the fact that they knew that people were sick and tired of not being able to rely on when the pizza would arrive. That sometimes it'd come an hour late, and it was too, you know, it would um, you'd be after your lunch break and you couldn't do it, or you had other plans, or came in the middle of a television show you planned on watching. And the other thing that, or it would come too quickly because you were planning on it taking an hour, and nobody knew. But the main part was it was a little bit too late. And everybody, well, there were thousands of pizza chains all over the country, and everybody thought, well, I've got good location. i got really tasty recipe. That's all that really matters. And along came Domino's, and a little bit of research told them that the customer was sick and tired of not knowing when that pizza was going to arrive. So out of that came their big idea, and they created that offer. Now, if I had said 
30 minutes or it's free, half an hour it's on us, um, 30 minutes or you don't pay. I could have they could have phrased that offer any way they wanted and they were still going to dominate the industry. And that's because they knew the prospect, they knew them so well. And so that's why research is such a key part of the copywriting process. And it is, it's, the, it's the power in your marketing. So everything else I'm going to talk about tonight, I don't want you to think that it's going to, you know, that the entire, there's a trick to one word that you can say that makes all your copywriting really super effective. When all the power is really in your research. And I'll talk a little bit more about all of these in a while. Okay, phase two of copywriting is the big idea or testing. And um, the big idea usually comes out of your research. It was that research that told Domino's, hey, let's make this offer that everybody's going to, you know, that everybody's dying to have. And you can get that, you know, research by doing surveys and, you know, talking to the audience or, you know, being aware. There's a lot of different ways to do research and get that. But the second phase of good copywriting is to do, um, is to extract the big idea out of their research. Now, it usually comes in one of those aha moments where people are letting their brain relax, they're off golfing or they're showering, and that most people say it happens in the shower, or they're driving along. My dad will, you know, would use the example of doing laundry and so forth. And you get this idea, and then what you want to do really quickly is test it. Just, you know, run it by some people and see if it makes people excited, if it, you know. Uh, my, my dad one time had a, uh, a pitch for the coat of arms letter, which is the most widely mailed sales letter in history, and he would actually go door to door and kind of give his pitch. And then um, he would see the reaction that people have and know, you know, uh, as he was honing this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between the, his process and my process in a moment. But the second phase of the copywriting process is developing that big idea and uh, testing it out a little to a degree. Now that testing could literally be just running it by a few people who are potential prospects. Uh, you could read your ad to people and if they say, hey, that's really well written, you know, that doesn't mean anything. If you read that ad to people and they say, hey, where can I get a copy of that? You know, well, in fact, when I created the editing book, I knew I was onto something when I explained what I was working on and a bunch of my copywriting colleagues turned around and said, you know, can I get that? And they didn't just say, can I get that? They would actually call me up and say, hey, when's that going to be ready? When's it, you know, they would push me to say finish that. And it wasn't just trying to finish, push me to finish something. They really wanted a copy of it because they heard about a few of the techniques that, um, that I put in. And they heard a few of the many that are in there. And by the way, this book is called The Halbert Copywriting Method Part 3. And the reason it's Part 3 is the Phase 3 is editing. Okay, editing is where all the professionalism in your copy comes from. Amateurs will take copy, and anybody can actually come up with a really big idea. And that takes a, that is the, what I call the talent. But the talent, you know, with enough research, you don't need that much talent to come up with the big idea. So the power in your research, the talent is in the big idea, and the professionalism is in the editing. And I will see amateurs all the time start off with a really strong hook and, you know, great attention-grabbing uh, device or hook or whatever you want to call it, and they, you will start going through the copy and it starts to get disjointed, you start to get bored reading it, and it starts to fall apart at, towards the end. And that's because it hasn't been edited properly. In editing, you will hear copywriting gurus in courses and on stages tell you that, you know, it's research, you know, come up with a unique hook, offer, or solution. That's, again, the big idea, the phase two. Or, you're, you know, and then, start editing and edit and edit, but they never tell you how to do it. Well, I'm finally showing everybody how to do it. Now, before I go on to the next, next part of this, what I want to explain is the difference between my father's writing style and mine and why they are different. Because you may be more like him or you may be more like me. Um, and, mo you know, most people, and you could also be somewhat in between. Now, my father, uh, the great Gary Halbert, started copywriting the day I was born. Now, I'm so old that I was born way before word processors were invented. In fact, they I don't even think the electric typewriter was done yet. So if my father wanted to do some typing or to, to get a piece typed, it would, he'd have to take it to a typist and, it was, and if he was going to make any changes, it took a long time. 
and it would be very expensive and time consuming. So he, so phase one about doing research is actually the same thing that he would do that I would do, which is step into the shoes of the prospect, you know, go to trade shows if they're there, talk with clients, become a customer, Be, you know, go through the process and, you know, read books on the subject and so forth. And in fact, there are far more avenues of doing research now than there were back in those days. And then he would let it, all that information gel around in his head, and I will do the same thing. <clears throat> now. I typically go for a walk. Uh, he often would come out with them on walks or runs, and all of a sudden you'd hear him snap his finger and go, got it, and he'd have his big idea, and it was a unique hook, a unique offer, or a unique solution, and it can be a solution to a marketing problem, like how to get advertising cheaper, um, or to, you know, to get your cost per leads down, or it could be a solution that the client is dying to have. Uh, but it, he would come up with something that was unique that would give you uh, an advantage over the competition. And this is the point where we would start to differ. <clears throat> Excuse me. My father would then walk around perfecting an imaginary pitch in his head. So he'd have this conversation, this imaginary conversation with a prospective uh, buyer. And he would talk in his head and, you know, and plan out how he was going to grab their attention, how he was going to set a hook or an anchor and then how he was going to you know, keep their interest and go through the phases of ADA, attention, interest, desire, and action. All marketing goes through those phases, and that's the right order. So he would work on you know, what's going to grab their attention, how am I going to keep their interest, how am I going to fuel their desire, and then what am I going to do that's really going to prompt them to act. Okay? And he would think about this pitch, and he would perfect it in his head. So that when he sat, when he eventually sat down with a legal size uh, yellow pad of paper, he would hand write out a complete ad. And my, it was you know as as time passed, that became close. His first draft became closer to the finished product than any other copywriter I have ever seen, and I have seen a ton. Now remember. I told you my dad started copywriting the day I was born. He actually started teaching copywriting to me first, so I heard all of his copywriting lessons, and I heard him, um, and I heard them the most often, and I saw them evolve and change over time as other people came to learn from him. So a lot of today's top copywriters were, you know, I'm watching them get trained, and I see the copy that they produce, and I still see winning copy, and I see winning copy from competitors of my father and so forth. I've been around the business so long. And what I'm going to show you is not magic. It doesn't make me extremely smart or clever or in any way. In fact, if you had started, if you had started being asked, you know, do, what do you think of this copy? Do you think it's going to pull better than the last one by the world's greatest copywriter at the age of 10? And you spent 40 years talking about copywriting, you would be every bit, if not even better than I am. I'm sure several of you on the call are. But, so, but the point that I'm trying to make is the, um, during, you know, what he, after he got that big idea, he would start writing that, that copy out by hand and he would perfect it. And he would then read the copy over to several people on the phones and so forth, and he was making slight, small tweaks, okay? And that's different than the way I work. Now, I still do the same research, okay? And I still, you know, think about those ideas, but once I get that big idea, I go and I start putting it into a first draft on the computer. Don't worry at all, and my suggestion to everybody is never worry about that first draft. Don't go around showing it to people. People will think you're unprofessional if they see that first draft, like, oh my God, because they have no idea how well it's going to turn out until you've massaged the copy. But then what I will do is I will, there, during that 30 days uh, that my dad's perfecting the, the copy in his head, I'm walking around, and if I got another idea, I pull out a pen and paper, I write it down, and when I get back to the computer, I massage it in. Now, when I'm planning out, my big ideas, and I'm planning out what we, uh, my dad and I called nugget notes, where you're writing, you know, here's an idea for a headline, and here's a point I want to make, and so forth. That's all done with pen and paper, and I still suggest people do it with pen and paper because you're faster with it and it's easier to remember. But when it comes down to just starting to type out that first draft, I do it on the computer. Now, in both instances, writing out your first draft by hand or writing out your first draft on the computer is the shortest part of the entire copywriting process. 
when I hear people are sitting down and you know typing out copy and working for four or five hours every day or three days a week, I'm like, you're not really copywriting, you're writing. But you know, the and you're or you're you know working with templates or something like that. Because all real copywriting is taking, you know, conversations either in your head or in real life and putting them, you know, putting those thoughts and everything down into onto paper or onto the screen. So again, this is where me and my father would differ is because he came from the age of typewriters. I came from the age where I could start doing that, putting it in right now, and then I would start massaging it. And in the editing process is where I'd make my copy a lot more light. Now, as good as, I will never pretend that it could anywhere become could become anywhere close to as great as my father's writing. But I will start to massage it and change it. And the difference between my first draft, my really ugly copy dump, as I call it, and the final product can be drastically different. I will move whole paragraphs up and down. I will rearrange sentences. I will, you know, belabor it, but for me, it's all a formula. And what happened was I started noticing uh, some people, you know, professional copywriters, they'd say, run copy by me, and I'd say, you know, I'd reword this this way, and I would just change this, make these changes here. And they would say, yeah, that's a really good change. And then eventually I learned to explain those changes and put it down into a formula. And so what I did was I, I said, you know, I'm going to, I need to c cover this subject. And what I am doing is I'm going to be covering phase one, phase two, and phase three. But what I did was that was the fastest part to get done. So I wrote the book, The Halbert Copywriting Method, Part Three. And it's like a Star Wars launch since it stands on its own and will make almost anybody a better copywriter. Actually, not almost. It will make anybody a better copywriter. And, you know, I'm not going to pitch to veteran copywriters because I really do think they, you know, it's a hard sell just to get them to read something because uh, of this nature because they think they know it. But those who have, you know, because I do have some friends who've read it, they're amazed by what's in there. So I'm even teaching, you know, veteran copywriters some new tricks they had never heard of because they're mine. And they're actually, I don't even want to take credit as being mine. What they are is they are patterns that I recognized over the years in great copy from my father and from other people. And I said, you know what, that, you know, um, this, this needs to be covered, especially because nobody else does. And since it was ready first, I put it out first. So one of the first questions I get is where, you know, where's part one and part two? And I call it the Star Wars launch. And there was another sharp lady pointed out that, yeah, this was like the Star Wars thing. And I knew that going in when I did that. And uh, part one and part two will be coming, but part three stands all on its own because it's the editing process. I'm teaching you how to take rough copy no matter who you've got. In fact, the formula is good for basically several things. One, if you are a copywriter and you read through this very short, very quick exercises and you look, look through them, you will find stuff that makes you a better copywriter. I do want to warn you, though, do not assume that because you hear something like a lesson on power words, that that means, oh, I know that because I got these power words in John Carlton's course and I'm, I, I know how to insert those in my copy. I actually teach you how to create your own list of power words. Because if I use my dad's list of power words in editing my copy and I'm trying to insert amazing and miracle and all these things that sound like a 1980 salesman, it's disjointed uh, in nature to the way that my copy flows and what I'm actually writing. If I take John Carlton's, you know, copywriting, you know, power words and insert them, all of a sudden I go from this kind of positive natured thing to, you know, slitting the competition's throat in the back alley and letting them bleed out and sounding a lot, as I say, Stephen King-esque. In any case, so in the book I teach you actually how to recreate your own list of very powerful copywriting word, uh, power words and so that when you're massaging and pumping up or amping up your copy, you will be able to do it too. Now. The book, real quickly, is just laid out in how to get people to read, you know, first make the decision to read your copy, then how to edit for clarity, and then how to amp up the copy or punch it up, and then how to inject it in psychology. And I'm going to show you um, a couple of these techniques now. Okay, three techniques I want to share. The first one is a basic technique. It is read your copy aloud. This, if you uh, know my dad's formula, my dad had five steps to his, his copy. It was, and I'm going to give them to you all right now. 
um, you read your copy out loud. And the reason that you do this is there is absolute, I dare anybody who has copy they've written that's a page or two from the past that you did not read aloud ever, and you read it out loud, you are going to find places where it is not smooth. You will also find a lot more typos and grammatical mistakes and places where you've you know, doubled up on a word and that you did not catch because when you're reading to yourself silently, your brain, especially if you've written this and you've read it several times, you're going to skip over a couple of you know, words because you're, you're reading ahead and you just quickly go over things because you know what you're expecting to come up and your brain just will not register these mistakes. And it is a simple technique that makes a huge difference. Now, remember when I said the professionalism comes in editing. Professionals do this. I was asked uh, recently to speak at a um, uh, direct marketing company and speak to their 12 copywriters. And I asked them, how many of you read your copy out loud? And only three or four put their hands up. And I was stunned. I'm like, this is one of the most basic techniques. And if you talk to anybody who actually does do this, they will start swearing by it. I teach my kids to do it with reports and so forth. It is just an editing technique that makes a huge difference. Now, if you're embarrassed about you know, reading out loud, go to a place where you're all alone when you do it. If you have to do it in public or around other people, tell them it's an old Gary Halbert trick or whatever you have to do. But do read your copy out loud. I still slip up because I think I'm writing a quick email and forget to read it out loud and I come back and I'm like, oh my God, you know, after some, you know, reading it out loud, I actually find it. Uh, errors and mistakes are places where the flow is just not right because if you stumble as you're reading it out loud, you need to reword the part that you stumble upon. And I have what I call Skype victims, people that I will call up either on Skype or on the phone and say, hey, can I read you this piece of copy? And I will read it to them, and I get feedback because I got a great group of friends um, for that process. But I also always catch errors and so forth. In that process, I'm reading my copy out loud. And this is one of my dad's um, major. You know, this is the first thing that he teaches you to do with his uh, editing process, which I'm going to sh shoot out to you right now. Break up your long paragraphs. Okay, you know, break up. He's called. He calls this creating eye relief. And what you're doing is you're really trying to get people to decide to read your copy. If you have ever seen copy that's designed not to be read, which, uh, or you, excuse me, you've all seen copy that's designed not to be read, and it's called a legal disclaimer. And it's one long paragraph, it's all caps, there's no breaks, there's no subheads, there's, you know, and it's super, it's just incredibly long sentences and so forth. It's designed not to be read. You need to do the opposite. So my dad would say, break up those long paragraphs, and then break up the long sentences. So read your copy out loud, break up the long paragraphs, break up the long sentences, and then um, insert subheads. Now, uh, subheads are just curiosity-driven, like secondary headline, sub um, points of excitement in the copy, and they're very tricky to do. I, teach, I can't cover that tonight because I, can te I teach that in the book, and the reason that is so important, and I'm going off my speech here for a second to cover it because it's going to give you a lot more valuable insight. There are basically four types of readers that when it comes to your copy. And everybody, everybody is looking for a place to stop reading your copy and feel like they can move on with their life without missing something that would benefit them. And what I teach you to do in the book is not to give them that spot. And it's a lot more than just leaving a bunch of cliffhangers that are annoying to the reader and so forth. But there are four types of readers that you're going to be creating your copy for. And one is the person who has kind of got OCD. They start reading at the beginning and they're going to continue all the way through or until they hit that spot where they feel safe not reading anymore. The second type of person is going to actually look at the headline. They're going to skim your bullets and they're going to skim your subheadlines. And if any one of them attracts them, they'll, they'll move in to the copy right there. And your copy needs to flow so that when they go right into that subhead and they start reading the paragraph below, they can continue reading without feeling like they're missing anything and go all the way to the end and then buy. Okay? A third group of people will actually read your, your headline, your bullets, and your PS and buy based on that decision alone. A fourth type of person will read your headline, your bullets, your subheads, and your PS and decide whether or not they feel like they need to read that copy before moving on. 
Um, and a quick trick for that is actually to recreate down in the PS your sense of urgency. So let's suppose I was pitching uh, my copywriting, my editing book, and my sense of urgency is that I have a special bonus that I'm offering with it. I would in the PS, and this is a very simple formula you can use, but you can you know write it, uh, you can write it, uh, you know any way you want. You don't have to use this formula. It's just a simple trick in case you're you know uh, out of ideas for it. You just say remember, and you repeat your benefit, and then you repeat your sense of urgency. So remember, this editing formula will make you a better copywriter, but there, but if, uh, you better act fast if you want to get a hold of the notepads with the editing checklist on it, because there's just a limited amount. That then, if you whatever your sense of urgency is, will tell the person who has skimmed the copy that if they want that benefit. They bet, and they're, and they're, you know, and they're the type of pe person who has to read the copy to even make that decision. They better start reading it. Okay. Now back to the point about subheads. The subheads are tricky because they have to flow for all four of these groups. They have to, they have to work well for the people just scanning it and making a decision to buy. They have to work well for the person who is scanning it, going to hit the subhead and then go in and fall from there. They have to work well and flow for the person who starts at the top and is going to read all the way through the bottom. Okay? And of course the four type is going to come back up and start reading from the top all the way down to the bottom. Uh, in the book I show you how to do that, but the important part is my dad, you know, when you do all this you're creating eye relief. And that is going to help people decide to read the copy. Have you ever gotten an email that you know you start reading? You go, how long is this? And you scroll down, and you see that it's seven or eight pages. You go, I ain't got time for this. I got to get on the road. Okay, people need to think that you know just reading the next sentence or reading the next line or reading the next paragraph or just starting to test out the copy and see how it feels is going to be really easy. And for them, easy means short and fast. Okay, so you create what my dad called eye relief by doing that. Now the final tip that he gave, and I give all these by the way in the book because he's got five, was to do a that hunt. Ninety percent of the time we use the word that, and we do not need to use the word that. Ten percent of the time it really is, you need to say it's that one. Um, you know, in other cases, eliminating it will make it actually sound smoother. Um, you know, this is the th thing that got your attention. This thing got my attention, or that got my attention. This thing got my attention. That's actually shorter, more powerful, more impactful. So he would go through trying to get rid of the as many that's as he felt necessary. Now there's been some debate. I saw one recently online about you know whether they should try and shoot for getting rid of all of them. And he never said that. He's the one who popularized this idea of getting rid of the instances where you use the word that. Um, but he was really only saying get rid of 90% of them because it was something that when we speak and when you write like you are speaking, which is a good thing to do to sound conversational, that's what you can usually pull out quite a bit. Okay, so that's my dad's five-step editing formula. I have in the book listed 32 ways to improve your copy. They are no, it does not, does not, not, not mean you're going to be reading your copy 32 times. It doesn't work like that. I just gave you five step editing process that you can do, sorry, which you can do <laughs> from beginning to end all in one, one pass. You can go through it, break up the long sentences, break up the long paragraphs, um, extract out exciting points or insert subheads and look for the that's. Okay, so it's not like these are, this is really 32 ways to improve or make your copy a lot better. Um, and so, but anyway, those are my dad's five. Now that's the first, so that the, the one basic reading, the one that I find most people overlooking and not doing the, of the most basic techniques is reading your copy out loud, so I wanted to mention that. The second one is a pronoun hunt, and this is more something that I've, I've taught people and developed. This is an intermediate technique, and before you think you know all about what this is, let, uh, hear me out. When you're writing your copy and you're writing your first draft, it is always very clear to you who you're speaking about. And you know, if you're telling a story and you say, you know, she grabbed uh, the phone, and then and then uh, you know, you're talking about two women, and you know, and then she got mad about it, and she said, I can't do this, and, she, and her rep she, her reply was, Yes, you can, and she said, Oh yeah, well, I can do this, and she said this, and she said that, and you can do it with he's, and you can do it with 
it and you can do it with talking about your program and your so forth and you you it's very clear to you but you can lose that reader that way um, in fact um, I just heard this great quote and I think I think it was from Churchill I could be mistaken but it was you know um, you're not editing you know and changing your words so that uh, you're understood it's to make sure you're not misunderstood and that's what you really are making sure of with this process. But here's a way to punch up your copy. I look for the, I sit down in the research phase and I write down, going back to research, I write down all the ways that I want somebody to talk about or describe um, the, what I'm writing about. So let's suppose I'm writing about this editing book. And I go, you know, it's, got, it's filled with new Gary Halbert lessons because it is. When I say it's, um, you know, uh, you know, it's a magic book of editing tricks, okay, or the little black book of editing, or whatever, uh, and I say that. Instead of talking about the book and saying in the book, the book, the book, the book, because the book is really a pronoun, it's not the proper noun, it's not the name of the book. And I don't want to say the Halbert Copywriting Method Part 3, the Halbert Copywriting Method Part 3, the Halbert Method, method Copywriting Method Part 3. I'll say in the Halbert, you know, when you're done reading the Halbert Copywriting Method, method uh, Part 3, you'll notice that this little black book of editing is actually very short. And this, you know, it's this magic copy, copywriting formula can help punch out, is helping to punch up the copy of even veteran copywriters. And, uh, you know, these new Gary Halbert lessons are really, you know, exciting a lot of people. I have now taken those pronouns and replaced them with, you know, really salacious uh, d uh, descriptions. And so what you want to do when you're starting the research phase of any project is write down, if it's about yourself, how you want to be described several ways. Write, if it's a product or a company, write how you want that company to be described several ways. And be ready to use those descriptions and those alternates whenever you come across the pronouns. Now, this should reinforce something that I said earlier, or uh, if, uh, that, I that I want to put out, which is during the copy dump, during the, the, that first draft, you don't want anything to disrupt the flow of your writing. Just keep writing. And when you know that the editing formula is going to massage the copy and clean up everything and make it so slick that people will fall through the copy in what they call the grease, creating the grease slide effect with your copy, and when you know that the editing uh, the process is going to take care of all this, you can just keep writing and writing and writing. And don't worry that you're saying it and he and she and they and book and other pronouns you're going to come back to those and punch up and massage the copy and make it super smooth anyway. Okay, so let me get to a final advanced technique, something that uh, very few people have ever heard of. I've got stuff in the book that nobody's heard of. Uh, this one, I think, I, you know, it's only a few people so far, only a few people who I've spoken to and taught it to know. Okay, and it is the magic ITU formula. Everybody thinks they know what I'm talking about here, but they do not. In copywriting, there's this principle about being personal that you want to say I, for every time you say I, you want to, or me, you want to say you or your two to four more times, okay? And I've heard this, uh, this kind of idea or formula repeated in copy courses time and time again, but that's actually not the way that I see it in the very best copywriting. The very best copywriting, the I or the me, takes on all the negative and the you gets all the positive. It's not actually a ratio. And there's some psychology behind this. So let's suppose that, you know, I think I know your story and I say, you know, I know you, you're staying up late at night. And you say, no, I'm not. I actually get to bed kind of early. And you're nervous about getting sales. Yeah, I am nervous about getting sales, but, you know, um, I've, got the, I've got the magic formula that's going to bring all the customers to your doors and so forth. And you're like, oh, really? You do? That's the kind of the thought process that's going through the reader's head. When you reverse that and you make the I, they, you know, and you say, this is, you know, you say, I was sleeping in my car. I was struggling to get to sleep at night. I was wondering how long I could keep the doors open in my business before I ran out of money. And that's when I discovered the secret that will allow you to fill your business, flood your, uh, your your company with new business and sales. In fact, you will get so much uh, business, you'll have to start, you know, you might have to take on extra employees or refer business to, God forbid, refer business to your competition because you're going to be that flooded with new sales. Okay, 
when you take, put it on in that perspective, the I thinks if they either nod their head and say, yeah, that's me too. And they, and they say that voluntarily in their head. And they get to the you and the your, and they're like they're imagining themselves actually having these problems and how great that would be and, to relieve, and the relief of the stress. There is no chance of them saying, no, that's not me. You're telling their story by telling you by telling your story. If it's a little bit slightly different, it's not throw, it's not breaking the spell. When you are writing copy and after you've done massaging it and editing it, you're casting a spell and you want to give them every single thought they have through, throughout the whole piece. You don't want them to stop and think, oh, wait a minute, that's not necessarily true. For even a moment, you want to give you, you know uh, you want to you know answer questions before they get them. You want to, um, and I show you how to do that. You want to make sure that they have it. At no point do they do they even dr mind drift off into thinking about anything other than the next, you know, wanting to read the next line. So with the magic IDU formula, as I call it, you're taking on all the negative in the I, and you're giving them all the positive in the U, and you're preventing any of that breaking of the spell by saying something which makes them think, oh, yeah, you think you're that great because you've got it all, or breaking of that spell by saying, actually, I'm not sleeping in my car. You know, yeah, I get nervous about sales or, you know, but at the point where they go, yeah, that's the feeling I've got, you're, tell you're telling my story or an exaggerated version of my story, they nod their head. Okay. Now, that's all I want to talk about, but earlier I mentioned that there's a free notepad with the purchase, and this is, this is true. If you go through my, my book, okay, and you don't have to go through the book, um, but you do have to get the book. It's only $10 on Kindle, and I do recommend that you get the, either the print or the Kindle version. If, I mean, if you get the print or the Kindle version, I do recommend you get the Kindle version because there's a free app on all your cell phones and you can have the editing formula right there at your fingertips all the time. And it's not, well this is not like a novel. Out of all the 32 ways I discuss it, the book is only about 100 pages. It is good with a lot of eye relief in it. All the lessons are super fast and that, you know, 120 pages includes a forward and the index section and the, and the intro. So I do recommend you do that, but no matter which copy you do grab, if you grab it, and remember, for ten dollars for a Kindle thing, you know I've already if if you know one one I only have to help you make one extra sale by smoothing out your copy for it to be worth the lousy ten bucks. This is a no-brainer, you know, kind of process. But it or, or excuse me, no-brainer purchase. But if you grab the book, what I want you to give you is I want to give you my checklist because I teach it in an order which is different from the way that I implement it. Now, the reason I don't just hand out and give out the checklist to people is because like the power words, like the IDU formula, people will think, oh, I already know that. I know the answer to that. I know what he's thinking. I don't even need to read the book. I want you to read the book. It is really super fast and easy to read, which is why I, did, you know, I made it that way so that you will get it. And everything has got a simple, you know, here's what, you, here's why you do this. Simple logic, simple way to do it, and you can immediately take every single thing that I teach you and put it into action. I don't teach anybody anything without telling them specifically how to do it. When you're done hearing me speak, or you're done reading a page, uh, or you know, or page or two of what show anybody to do anything, they can immediately go and change their copy. They can immediately go and, you know, rewrite the, or, or rearrange or massage the last thing they wrote and make it better. But I put the editing steps in the formula, again, of, you know, how to make them, help them decide to read your copy, providing eye relief and some of the, a lot of the stuff I covered tonight. Then on how to make sure that you're you know, uh, editing for clarity so that you're never cast, breaking that spell. How to punch up that copy and make it extra exciting and evoke more emotion in your reader. And then how to inject hidden psychology that makes them want to buy, that they're just, they don't even know that you've done that. It's not like just inserting a power word. It's actually creating these, this feel and rhythm type of thing um, that makes them feel like they're going to miss out big if they don't jump on board. And basically, the, to get that bonus, all you have to do is go to this website, bonhalbert.com, as my dad would say, very cleverly named, forward slash bonus. Now, the regular website right on the front has got a checklist right now 
of my father's toolbox. And, it, and if there are just some tips in there because I'm going to start giving out all my checklists. That's just the first one I figure is, the, it's funny because I'm starting with the very first one and the last one. You know, this is stuff that you'd want to have right when you're, before you even start the research process. And the last stuff, and I'm going to start filling in the blanks in between. But on that page, there's just a regular old sign-up form. You want to go to the page that says forward slash bonus. There's a tab at the top. And when you go to that tab, you can sign up there and give me your physical address, and I will send you a notepad um, with my checklist in the order in which I implement the steps um, or look for things. That's a better way because they're not steps. Again, this isn't 32 things that you're going to go through. But the thing, you know, what I'm trying to do accomplish first is at the top, and you know, the in the things that I'm looking for, this is the order in which I look for it and implement the process and it's print, the checklist is printed on every single page of the notepad that I will send you for free if you sign up there and you'll get an email back and in that e after you get that email back all you do is hit reply and send me a copy of your receipt. It can be a pr pr digital receipt, snap a picture of, your, you know, of the receipt that after you printed that out or however you want to do it. But that's my whole pitch <laughs> for a $10 book and hopefully, I've, if, if I'm going to take questions and take, take a look at the questions in just a second, hopefully I've given you enough value to even cover the expenditure of the $10 for a book. And, and people, everybody who wanted to know if, about the print version, it is ready now. The people who got, uh, like, it, when I first put it out on Kindle, people were like, where's the print version? So I threw it up on the print version. And I didn't realize it was, uh, I forgot that it's formatted for Kindle. So, you know, everything in Kindle, you know, you don't, you can't indent and, you know, there's stuff that's just differences in the formatting. So it was exactly the same good information, but it has now been perfected uh, in both the print and the Kindle, Kindle version. So, and there are a lot of people who prefer print over Kindle, and I do recommend you go ahead and get the print version. Just make sure that you get the Kindle too, because for $10, why not have it in your pocket? And that's my that's my spiel. So let me talk. Let me see if I got questions. I got Steve? a few, Bond. Yeah, I've been I've been fielding these, and and already people are saying, "Ha, this is the best ten dollars." They've already gone over there and bought it before you even asked. <laughs> Denny said that. John said that. Uh, uh, Doctor Keith said, "Oh my God, this is unbelievable stuff." I mean, everybody, and and Denny just said, "Come on, where's the four hundred ninety-seven dollar course? I want to buy it." Sorry, Denny. <laughs> Sorry, Denny. I'm going to disappoint you tonight. We're not. We're not pitching that. I told you, just extreme value. Uh, well, yeah. guys. Hey, okay, Bond. Are you looking? Are you looking at the questions now? Because I'm just now seeing some of the questions. Okay, so everybody, how about standing up, giving a round of applause if you really appreciated what you just heard here, because it was stellar. I told. I, and I want you. And I want you to know, I have not given you the best of the best yet. I mean, you, you, you are, the, when it comes to the hidden psychology stuff, I'm giving you a lot better in the book. When it comes to the clarity and the power words or, or you know, you get these explanations and you are going to get a lot out of it. Spoken like a true copywriter. <laughs> <laughs> but I've held back. All right. Um, well, I wrote down some stuff, and, and, and if anybody has any, any questions or any comments, what you like the best, I'm going to tell you what I like the best, and I'm going to let people comment about what they like the best. But first of all, thanks for, you know, just giving us some bite-sized nuggets that are going to help us right away, the three phases, Absolutely. the three techniques. I want to speak about what you said about reading out loud, because I want to tell you real life how this means to me. This happens to me all the time, and I think I do read things out loud sometimes. But, you know, if I am doing a video sales letter and I, and I write my first draft, and, well, I do my research and I write my first draft and then I go and I do my editing, I can't help it. Every time I turn on to record and I start reading it out loud, I always have to stop and say, oh, that doesn't make sense. You know, and, <laughs> and I think I've done it, right? I think I've done it. I think I've edited it. But when you're saying it out loud, you're right, Bond, every single time. You stop and say, "Whoa, that doesn't make sense." I got, I got to punch this up. I got to clean it up. The guys at the room where I where I told you I was speaking, they actually said, "Okay, we're going to designate this area where people can go in and read their copy out loud." Um, it is, it is, just, it's amazing to me how anybody could do it a few times and then 
not do it because that and that includes me. I get lazy and I'm like, oh, this is just a quick, like I said, it's just a quick couple of paragraphs in an email. This is short. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, I, <laughs> I've used this word twice in a row and there's this typo and, you know, all of these other things. Gary must have come in a little bit late. He says, where can we get copywriting part one and two? So you want to tell them about the Star Wars launch again? Yes. As I was explaining earlier in the webinar, all great copywriting comes in three phases. And really short, the first one where all the power is is in your research. Um, and part, uh, phase two is where you uh, come up with hooks, ideas, offers, and solutions that come, uh, they're called the big idea, which you get from that research. And phase three is editing, when you massage that copy. And editing was the, the part of this that I could get ready first. And it was, all, it was ready, and people were chomping at the bit for me to give it to you, the, the people who had, who had read the, um, some of the stuff, too. They're like, man, I want the rest of it, and I want it badly. So I went ahead and published that because it stands on its own. The great thing about this, the, the formula is if you write copy with templates, you'll know that it comes out wonky. Read it out loud if you don't believe me. And the editing formula will fix that. If you use copywriting software, which is starting to come out now, you're going to get wonky copy. And you can, the editing formula will fix that. If you write copy for yourself, you will write, you will um, get better at, at copy because these will start to seep into your copywriting style. And you'll say, ah, yeah. And you know what? And you'll say, I've seen that happen before. So part one and two are coming. By the way, I never really talked about what I'm going to cover in part two. One is obviously going to be research. Part two, I'm going to show you tricks for overcoming writer's block and tricks for getting unique hooks, ideas, and solutions. I taught uh, Steve a trick yesterday about coming up with hooks, and that's just one of several in my bag of tricks. Um, so uh, I am going to cover those things. Uh, it's just that part three was ready first. So we call it the Star Wars launch <laughs> because, you know, the, the third in the series was actually already a great story and could stand on its own. So they went ahead with three, uh, four, and five, and then they didn't come back into, uh, to do the other ones until later. Actually, no, they started with part four, right? Star Wars, the original, was part four. So yeah. Steve from uh, Steve says from Indonesia slash Australia, the ITU was worth a hundred times the price of the book. I'm picking up a copy. Thanks a million. Ah, oh, thank you. Know I really appreciate it. I really do. And uh, the book I made the book ready for everybody, Linda. Um, uh, I'm showing it on my screen right now. Um, is everybody seeing my screen? They're asking where to get it. You get it on Amazon. Okay. Um, no affiliate links, no nothing, just this is the best $10 that you're going to spend today, tomorrow, this week, this year. Uh, go over and get it. Just type in Bond Halbert in books in Amazon. You're going to see it. Bond, while we're here, yeah, do you mind telling us anything you want, guys? Oh, well, do you, will you tell us about the Boron Letters and, and what it's all about and why it's so special? Sure. Um, the Boron Letters, uh, okay, for those of you who don't know, my father... And I'll actually give you a little insight into, into if you got the time. My father was actually sent away um, to prison for a crime he actually did not commit. Now, that does not mean, and my dad was the first one to admit, that he didn't commit some crimes and he wasn't a, um, he wasn't an angel, okay, or that, he, you know, or that, excuse me, that he was some sort of angel. He was one of the first ones to readily admit that. But what happened was, a long time ago, back in the day when you did mailing lists, you needed to, uh, the way you did was you, you tested some names and if they worked well, you bought a, the bigger segment of the list and you rolled out and you mailed and made, made a bunch of money. Well, my dad was going up and down on his luck and he was getting kind of down to the point where he needed to make some more money. So he asked a list broker, he said, you know, you got a list for me. And I'll make this, this by the way, a lot of people don't know. Um, and so the guy said, yeah, what he did though was he took a people who uh, were buying commemorative plates. And, but he didn't just take a list of people who were buying commemorative plates. He ran it in the computer and matched it with other lists of people who ran com bought commemorative plates. And he had it spit out a thousand names of people who were on every list, meaning these are people who will buy any commemorative plate, right? So my, and then he, my dad says, oh, wow, that list is really hot. Give me the entire list and I'm going to mail it. And so he sunk all of his money into mailing a large bunch of names to get the cash. 
what, and this is by the way, the process was called a merge purge because you would merge the lists and purge out all the names that were that were super hot. Anyway, so he ran out of money and he started to not be able to make his refunds. Postal inspector comes by, sees him living in a big house um, that he had actually rented, but you know this was not prosperous times for my father, and they promptly you know, started filing charges against him. So my dad did eventually go to jail for mail fraud. Okay, and the charge he was crime he was charged with was the intent to rip people off. Now by this time, my dad had already written the most widely mailed sales letter in history. He had several promotions that were really big sellers. At no point in his career had he ever ran an ad, decided to take the money and run, and not make refunds or give anybody anything. So that whole thing was you know the whole idea was preposterous that he had even committed this, but. That's how he ended up in there. And I like to, you know, he never really kind of defended himself, but I like to when people bring it up. So my dad was sent away to Boron Federal Penitentiary. Uh, it's actually a level one, so it's not, you know, I don't want you to get the idea that he was in Attica or something like that, but he was locked up. And while he was there, he sat down and he wrote letters to me explaining his business in the direct response business and life lessons. So there's more in the books than just you know copywriting lessons. There's books and it's a lot about direct marketing, but it's also about life lessons. And every other page or so starts with Dear Bond because these are actually letters that he wrote to me. And since you know he's writing to his youngest son, and at that time he had you know he had no intention of publishing these letters. <laughs> Um, but so the, you know that it is raw, that it is real, and it's straight to the, uh, it, it was straight to the point in what it was. Well, one day he called me and he said, you know, can I publish those letters? Because he knew that they were personal to me too. And I said, okay, you can do it. And he was using, you know, the money to help, you know, fund like my college at the time. And so I said, sure, go ahead and do it. And then he put it, started publishing them, and they became like a cult classic. Now, then I realized that the letters, because they were, you know, they started to get this feel that they were dated, which is not actually true. And what I did was I went and added notes at the end of each letter to explain behind the scenes things that were going on. Um, extra, you know, parts of the lessons that my dad had given me in person that weren't in the letters, and how to uh, and explain how those lessons could be applied to, to modern marketing. And I created an updated version of the Warren letters, and I put it up on Amazon. And that book is extremely popular, and it is a very again, it's a fast read, and it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible resource. In fact, I and many of my cohorts will reread that book you know, once a year and get more out of it and be reminded. You know, that's another thing about the checklist and the in the editing book. Even the even the people who think, you know, they're like, I think I know all of this and nobody has so far. There's not been one person who's gone through the thing and not found something new in the book. And most people, the, the newer you are, everything's going to be like, oh my God, this is really how you do the editing. I, everybody talks about it. I never knew that. Um, but even the people who, even if you knew 80% of it, it's a great reminder of what to do. So going through the book and going through the Boron letters is the same thing, where you go through it and you're like, oh, that's right. I need to target the leads locally. So here's a lesson out of the Boron letters. You turn around and let's suppose I, Steve, where do you live? I, I, sorry about that. I muted myself. I live just south of okay. Dallas. I live just south of Dallas. Okay. And we're going to pretend so you don't have to say it. We're going to pretend you live on Elm Street, okay? So let's suppose I start a campaign and I say, hey, uh, and I'm a targeting Steve, and I say, you know, here's something every homeowner should know. He's like, yeah, okay, I, I own a home. I maybe, maybe that's of interest to me. Maybe not. I'm kind of busy. Hey, here's something every Texas homeowner should know. Well, I'm a Texas homeowner. Maybe you're a little bit more attracted to it. Here's everything that everybody who owns a home in Dallas needs to know. Okay, wait a minute, maybe I really, you know, now I'm amping it up. If I say, here's something that everybody who owns a home on Elm Street in Dallas needs to know, now I've got his attention, right? There's no way he can not look at that. And sometimes you forget to do that personalization, and you can do it in email. Your email, you know, when you sign up for an email, it tells you what, you know, city, it gives you, it gives you a longitude and a latitude, 
but it gives you the city and where you come from, and you know you know what they've signed up for, and you, and you know if you're doing surveys, you might know you know specifically. Here's here's something that every copywriter in Dallas, Texas needs to know. Here's something that every direct marketer in Dallas, Texas needs to know. You think Steve's not going to open that? So this is a lesson that, and I'm only giving this as one example, where even though you know that lesson, or you might, not being reminded of it is leaving money on the table. Because you go back and you read that, um, you know, you read through the board letters and you get all those good quality basics. And I'll tell you something. We were talking about this uh, the other day. The difference between people who know the basics and the psychology of the old school versus the people who know the new school, and there's a benefit to both. The old school people have this core understanding and um, and I know this really well because you know I had my 10,000 hours in direct response marketing very very early in life, and I heard these lessons over and over and over and over again. I spent um, my childhood. You'll see in the in the Born letters, he explains how he really started teaching me. I'm not just some kid who fetched his water or something. He started teaching me how to how to uh, formulate and create direct response winning campaigns at such an early age. I think I was around 11. Uh, 10 or 11 at the time and he started giving me these lessons and the, he gave me these lessons and when he was sick when I was 17 is when he started to actually teach people when he started writing his newsletter and writing a, a book and um, put in, and then eventually putting it online and becoming the guru that he is now known for and so I had this at a very core level at a very base level so that I understood the psychology behind everything and understanding that was allowed me to get an advantage in the modern world because when the modern world you have these tools that weren't available to us back in the day you know we couldn't get answered if you wanted to test a headline you had to pay thousands of dollars to run it a paper you had to wait weeks for it to run run it to the printer I mean it took a lot of money and time and effort just to even get it out there now you can get the answer to that with a Google ad in like you know an hour um, and the, so the advantages that you have nowadays with technology are great, but people stop and they don't get that psychology part about what I had just described about targeting the leads on a very, you know, to, to getting so specific and targeted in your copy because you get the, you have better tools for doing that now, but so many of the people who know those tools have focused so much on technology, they don't understand the psychology behind what I had just explained. And when you can combine the two of those, you got a lot of power. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, it, you know, it, it, if you follow what's in the in the the boron letters, and you and you look at that, you'll understand. Especially in the updates, I don't let you get lost. You know, if he talks to you about nine seven six year numbers, you're like, oh, you know, that's so old school. It doesn't make a difference. I explain to you exactly how that can still be applied today and make money in ways that you're probably not thinking of. So. Um, I went through and updated that, and it became a, you know, it's it's a cult classic, and so many people just love that book, and there are people who buy multiple copies, and people who buy it, um, and, I, and I only say that, I'm not trying to get you guys to buy multiple copies, there were different formatted versions around. Uh, but they have it so that they have one, you know, um, you know, they keep them in different places. I know people who are like, you know, I have one that I travel with and I have one on my bookshelf. And um, that book is, it's just, it's, you know, people say, what's my favorite book of all time? That, of course, you know, it's, I've got a very biased opinion. Um, but it is, it is a, it is an incredibly good uh, read. And people just, you know, love it. And I, I'm, and I'm not taking credit for them loving it. People love it without my updates. But the, you know, the, I just wanted to explain that it is an updated version that you get when you get it in print or you get the uh, Kindle version. Well, it wasn't the purpose to sell more of those books, but a lot of people went ahead and bought that. They're loving things so <laughs> much tonight. So let me ask you about the last thing. Are you still involved with the Gary Halbert letter? I and my brother run the Gary Halbert letter now. What we did, though, is we left the Gary Halbert letter sort of alone. We'll, we'll put in a thing here or there, um, but we basically wanted to leave it as a, as a um, kind of like a let to preserve my dad's legacy. So, for example, he said, you know, you'll never find a banner ad on his website, and so we don't put in any kind of pop-ups or anything like that, and the, the design and the layout is left so that um, it is as it was when he departed us. Um, now, 
and th with that being said, there is, you know, sometimes you'll see a new letter or a new thing pop up in the archives, and there's still a good reason to sign up to be on that list. And what we did for a while is, and it's not that I'm trying to send you to different sites and everything, is if my brother and I did something that was kind of related with us together, or we were doing something that, you know, we were like breaking down something, one of my dad's ads or something, and it wasn't just purely about our father, we created and put it on a site called Halbertizing, which this one links to, halbertizing.com. But the Gary Halbert letter is a collection of all of his, um, not all of them, but most of his back issues, because he brought the letter from when it was physically mailed out online in 1991. Wow. And... The, um, some of the back issues are actually reprinted. He went through and kind of selected out his favorites and put them on there on the website. And that's been the mecca of, um, of copywriting for, or for copywriters. And that site has affected more copywriters than any other resource on the planet. And I don't care if you're talking about you know, David Ogilvy or even people you know, with more well-recognized names. This is where so many people say, I went there, I discovered it, I started reading, I was up for a week, I couldn't stop. <laughs> and we, we leave it there for them, for that, uh, for that reason, and we, we are 100% in control of it. We still do add some new things to it in the letter archives. Um, feel free to come check it out. It's all great free information. There are a lot of copywriting um, masters who, you know, make their copy cubs hand write out some of these letters so that they can try and uh, get Gary Halbert copywriting style, you know, get a taste for how it feels to write copy like him, and get what my dad's called a neurological imprint of what it's like. Now, I myself speak a, little, a lot like my father. I'm not as good as, as you know, well-spoken or as good of a public speaker as he was. In fact, he would probably chastise me for giving people so much how without, or, you know, to do things without the, just giving them the what, you know. Because if you go to events and everything, everybody wants to give you the, they tell you what to do. You know, research, you know, come up with a big idea and edit your book. And nobody has tells you about how to edit. In fact, I've never, I, I've been in this business forever. I've never seen a book or anybody cover the subject on how to edit your copy. But I've seen many, you know, dozens of people say you need to edit your copy, edit, 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 right? But they don't give you the tips and they don't give you the specifics on how to. Um, um, so what I did was I just said, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start covering that. But my dad, my dad was much better, you know, at giving you the what and getting you all excited and then telling you, here, buy my $499 course. Um, and he was just so, so great at it, but one of the things that he taught people was to, you know, to hand write out letters. You, pe you hear people debating whether that's of value. And for some reason, some people, it's not really of value. For other people, it makes all the difference in the world because people learn differently. You know, people have different parts of their brain. Some people, when you hand write out or type out things and you start writing in people's voice, it starts to really sink in in a way it doesn't for people who just read it. And it has made a lot of people great writers. I end up writing quite a bit like my father because I talk like my father. One of my, I got the same compliment from two people. Mark Victor Hansen, who did Chicken Soup for the Soul, I was on the phone with him once, and I was also on the phone with Bill Glazer once. And I was talking to them about something uh, different times. And they both said, you sound just like your father. And, and I mean, they meant it. They, and I don't, my voice doesn't sound like his. At all, they met my tone, the way that I speak, the way I bring things up, um, you know, the arguments that I make and everything. And I, you know, my my head was, of course, I sound like my father. Doesn't everybody sound like their father? That you know, <laughs> you know, you grow up learning persuasion techniques from your parents. You know, if your mother screams and uh, or cries to get what she wants when she, you know, she needs to persuade somebody, you end up screaming and crying. Well, my dad had persuasion techniques, you know, coming out the wazoo. And he would assess the situation and say, okay, this is, you know, and this, by the way, is a great marketing lesson. He would first assess somebody and say, okay, try and understand who they were, their point of view, their perspective, and think, what is it that you would really want that I could give you that would make you very happy to trade me for what I want from you? And, and that, in the essence, is a lot of, a lot of the persuasion, you know. Sometimes, sometimes it's, 
guilt. Sometimes it is, you know, pleading. Sometimes it is something else. But that's the very first question he, you know, in his mind, he's always going to ask somebody when he wants to persuade them to do something or buy something, is what? What's your dream? It's all about you, you know, uh, before it's about me. He would then turn it into it's all about me, right? <laughs> Getting what he wants. But it was all about you when he was assessing you, trying to speak, uh, you know, to you. You know, one of the things that I, a lot of people will talk about is, you know, in copywriting, how you want your, your copy to be at a very low grade level, right? Because nobody gets upset that you're, something you say is, is very clear. My father had a really extensive vocabulary. In fact, when he went to Vaughan, they gave him an SAT uh, test and his vocabulary was off the charts. And you would never know that if you were just listening to him or reading his, his, his <laughs> copy. He wanted you to get the message. He didn't want you to stop and get hung up on the fact that he mentioned a word you didn't understand, ever. And he, I mean, he read, he, had, he was a, a incredibly, um, he was incredibly into books. He was, at any, when I was a kid, at any given time, he had four or five books in the back seat of the car. And he, you know, he read on every bit of downtime. If we were going into a movie theater, he'd tell me to go get his popcorn and his Coca-Cola, and he would go take an aisle seat and, you know, while the lights are still on in the, in the intermission and sit there and read until the movie started. He, he, all of his time that he killed, he killed writing when, we were, uh, when I was young. And he had just had an incredible vocabulary, but nobody would know it. And one time, um, this is my favorite thing, what, um, um, and I mentioned this in the book as well, um, there's an app that most of you should be aware of called Hemingway, right? And in that app, you put your copy through it, and it kind of highlights where, you've, where you're speaking at a 12th grade level or 11th grade level or what have you. Well, I one time wrote an email for Scott, to sell Scott Haynes' product, and I was sitting there at my son's... Uh, soccer practice and he he was just practicing so I didn't have to watch and I was sitting there typing out and I needed to write this email so I wrote it and I sent it to to Scott he goes he says man that was a really good email he goes and you know what I put it through Hemingway and I never ever use Hemingway um, because I just knew that you know I know when I'm saying something that's clear or something that is not clear or at a higher grade level and he said I, I checked it out it came in at three and a half grade level now, most copywriters shoot for between five and seven. Five is like, oh, my God, I really did it, right? <laughs> um, and I was like, I was, you know, I was like going to pat myself on the back. And then somebody put something that my dad wrote through it and came up with the third grade level. And I was like, yep, he's the master. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the only guy who will always beat me, you know, is, is him, you know. All right. Hey, Bond, one more thing here. This has been unbelievable. And, you know, um, First of all, I, I don't know if you're seeing, but so many people are thanking you uh, for such a special, special evening. And oh. I know you said your your dad would be chastising you for talking so much about the how, but it has meant so much to everybody. Uh, and I am I'm going to put you on the spot, Bond. I'm not even going to ask permission tomorrow. I will beg for forgiveness. But you said <laughs> something to me yesterday, and and you explained to me why one thing you do better than your father is teaching. Right? Yeah. And you explain that to me. Go ahead. Real quickly, go ahead and tell people why you are a better teacher than your dad. And then I'm going to put you on the spot. Well, first, I want everybody to not repeat that ever. Uh, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like being Frank Sinatra's kid and saying, there's a song I sing better than pop. And people are like, the hell with you. They get mad at you for even thinking that. But here's the real reason. And by the way, I want to first preface this by saying something that my dad always told me. He said, Bond, everything you do that's great or wonderful, I get credit for because I taught you to be who you are. And everything that you do that sucks, nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that in mind. He does get credit for anything I do do. Um, so what he did say to me was, uh, or what he did was, as I said, I started learning these lessons about marketing and copywriting at the age of 10. So my dad had these speeches that were, he would, I'd see them first, I heard them the most often, and I saw them refined over time. And I saw him train several people. So I have every one of his lessons in my hip pocket. 
I have them to a degree where my first speaking gig, we were at a, we a conference and he wanted me to have some speaking uh, experience. So he waited to just the right moment and said, Bob, I got to go to the bathroom. Go up there and give my APAL BPAL speech. <laughs> and, he, and I went up completely unprepared and gave the APAL, his APAL BPAL speech. I was very nervous when I did it. And so I'm sure I made a, mis a misstep here or there. But I heard all of these things. Um, oh, it says that we've lost sound. No, I don't think so. I think it's only Mark. Okay. Is everybody else hearing Bond okay? I only see some of these, by the way, because as I'm talking, I don't look. At, I can't look at the. And questions. they're and they're going by so fast, but that's all right. Yeah. Everybody's hearing you. Uh, Mark had a problem. Okay, so I learned all of these lessons, and I have them in my hip pocket. But I understood them at a core level so early that I got what's the most important part of the criteria. And then when I would start seeing these things, like the IDU formula, my dad never mentioned that. My dad never mentioned the pronoun hunt that I taught everybody tonight. And they were things that were patterns I recognized. Um, my, if I have any talent at all, during, when I do the, um, when I've done personality or IQ tests and everything, they say I'm strong in pattern recognition. And so I would recognize these patterns in copy and then I, as I start to explain them to copywriters as I was going over their copy, they would go, aha, uh -huh, and I, I would, Learn, I learned from my father how to explain it in a very simple way that you could, you could take what I was teaching you, you could immediately understand the value. I, the one thing I was able to do is I didn't have to tell people I'm a great copywriter. I didn't have to tell people how much experience I had. In fact, I couldn't. To tell you the truth, one time I wrote an email called, Thank God My Dad Went to Prison. And the reason I wrote that is because if it weren't for him explaining the story inside the born letters, nobody would have proof of this incredible education he gave me at such an early age. Nobody would believe it. They would believe, yeah, you know, he told you a few things when he was 10. You didn't understand he was taking me out of school and flying me around the country and having me participate in business meetings and telling me what was going to go on before the meeting and then t t discussing the meeting and what everybody's really going to do after the meeting. You know, you didn't get that unless you, you wouldn't understand it unless you read that book. And so, thank God he went to the prison, prison and wrote that book. By the way, that was one of my most widely talked about subject lines. But um, he had done that so, so often and so early and that I had learned to, uh, you know, I couldn't tell people that. I, when I was younger, I couldn't say until he put out the born letters, I couldn't say, yeah, I'm 30 and I got 20 years of direct marketing experience. You know, people just thought it was total BS. So when I teach people stuff, I had to teach people exactly how it works, why it works, and how to do it in, in, a, in a quick um, way that would make them be able to instantly go, that just makes total sense, and I'm going to go do it that way. I've never heard it explained that way, and I can now do this. And so that was my favorite thing. You know, when I teach people how to get emails open, they'd immediately go and test emails and triple their open rates. When I would teach people how to get... Um, you know, how to get Amazon to sell your books for you, they would go, that's brilliant, you know, and I see how that works, and you could go immediately apply it. Um, and so all the lessons that I learned for copywriting or for direct marketing or any of that stuff, it really comes back to the core lessons I got my, from my father, so I still give him credit. But the only reason I say it, and mention that I was better than him in that regard was because I have all of his lessons in my hip pocket and I've added to them and I have and I have technology skills that he didn't have because you know he wasn't you know um, it wasn't you know he wasn't coming of age with the computers and so even with the GaryHalbertLetter.com that list is tens of thousands of names. It's been built up over 20 years. It's never been scrubbed and I hold the record for the highest open rates. Um, at like 54% for that one. And, but again, that's because, you know, I still give every, I still go back to the original thing I was just saying. I give credit to my father for everything I did right. Now the Halbert saying was, now you go do this. And if it works, it works out, you give me, come back and give me credit. And if it doesn't, I never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> so by you the go. way, I'm going to pat myself on the back there, right, right there, Bond, because of something that you said. And, and, and my folks listening are going to know this when I say it. And you said one of the things that gives you an advantage is that you can do the technology, too. You've got old school ways, and you've got the technology, too. And I've got a favorite saying that I like to say, which is technology changes nothing, but it improves everything. And I, I take it you're kind of saying the same thing. If we know old school ways, 
but we can now bring technology to make it better, faster, cheaper, just like headline testing on Google versus direct mail headline testing. That's, uh, you know, I think that's right on target. It is 100% on target. I had no idea about SEO or websites. And my brother, I told him, I would say, hey, you want to change this uh, website? And he'd give me a bunch of spiel about, oh, you don't know how difficult and time consuming this is, Get, you know, blah, blah. And I said, you know, I'm tired of hearing this, so I decided to start my own website. And I said, you know what, I don't know anything about SEO. But one thing I know is that Google's got a billion, you know, spending millions of dollars on these super smart people who are smarter than I am to try and figure out who to weed out and who to let up in the, in the feed. I'm going to become who they're looking for and let them worry about it, right? And so I started putting up, you know, putting a website together just to learn the mechanics of websites. And it, it climbed, it did climb to number one. Um, and then it actually, to pat on my own back, I got 136,000 unique visitors a year and before I just dropped it and let the whole thing go because like my dad, I'd get bored. Um, <laughs> I'd get bored and move on to do something else. That was My dad was notorious for that as well. But uh, for that website, I needed to run a Google ad. I wanted to run a Google ad so that um, people would see it and then the Google algorithm would see what the time on site was. And the time on site, by the way, while a lot of people were measured in second, mine were measured in minutes. And I mean like, you know, between 7 and 17 minutes on site, on average. And I ran this Google ad, and I said if I was doing the search string, what is it I would want to see that would make me click on it? And I wrote, you know, I was confined to the, to the spaces that you would, you're allowed to on a Google ad. And my very first Google ad got a double-digit click-through rate. And it wasn't... This wasn't before people had started right making courses on you know keywords and Google advertising and stuff like this, and I don't take I'm not the I'm not the person to learn all of that from. Um, the The important part of it was the, I took old school and applied it to that new school technology, and it was the old school uh, um, ways that gave me the advantage. You're 100 percent right, Steve, and I love your phrase. I'm going to probably steal that from you at one point. As long, um, I'll as, credit, you, as long as you give me credit. <laughs> I'll credit you till I forget you. I'll credit you till I forget you. Um, wow. But, Bond, Bond Halbert is quoting Steve Rosenbaum. You just made my <laughs> night, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, I just, you know, the thing was, it was just, I recognized that the, you know, the, what it, it was, again, it was the ability to put people in their, sp into, into the, put yourself into their position, into their space. All right. Well, Bond, I think that's it. Everybody's saying thank you, and everybody's talking about their hands are tired from writing so many notes, or their fingers are tired from typing so much. But um, you, you really, you really did uh, just make it a great evening for everybody, and I thank you so much. And everybody, one more time, how about a round of applause for Bond? And uh, what, what else can I say? Just thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. All right, Bond. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, we love you all and, and really appreciate you spending the time with us. And uh, I'm glad it was such a great evening for everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Yeah, me too. Bye, everyone.